Thank you, Pastor Rocky, for that introduction. I uh, thank all of you, our TBE fam, for tuning in, for watching. It is Sunday morning, and this is the Blueprint Experience. We are so glad that you are here. Before we go any farther, we want to give you the opportunity to worship with giving. We do believe that is a form of worship. It is definitely not something that you're required to do or something that we expect you to do. But if you feel led to give this morning, uh, we have a real easy way that you can do that. We have a thing called text to give, and we are going to throw the number up here on the on, on the um, screen. I hope because I'm going to look really stupid if there's no number up here. So hopefully there is. And you just te text that number, and you text the word give. You send it, and then you will get a text message back with a link. You click on the link, it sends you to a kiosk, and you can simply give that way if you feel led. Um, definitely not something that you are obligated to do. So, <clears throat> have you ever had a situation where you thought something was going good? You were like, man, this is a good situation. Everything seems to be going all right. But then, like, somebody that's going through that situation with you, you, you find out that they don't think it's going, well, that good. Like, they're like, well, this is going really bad. I, I, it could be finances, it could be a relationship, it could be just watching a movie. You know, you might be like, this is a really good movie, this is awesome. The person watching the movie with you is like, this movie sucks. It is terrible. Like, how would anybody watch this thing? So, that's perception, right? We all look at things different, we have different perceptions. Well, I was reminded <laughs> of a time where... Something I thought was really good, it was like a really good memory for me, well, it wasn't really good for somebody else. So, yeah, let, let me explain. All right, <clears throat> so I have two sisters. I have Angie and Chrissy, and um, they are much, much older than me. <laughs> Not really, I'm the oldest, but I like to tease them about that. So there was a time Angie, my sister, she... Um, well, you got to understand this. My grandmother, back in the day, she wore many hats, and one of them was barber, and she cut all of our hair. So she was just like our private barber. Um, yeah, not really a good thing, I guess. But anyways, my sister Angie, she kept taking her hair and putting it behind her ears, and my grandmother would get onto her and tell her if she don't stop doing that, her ears were going to grow out like this. All right. Makes sense, I guess. Um, so Angie kept doing it. So my grandmother, being the, the, the smart, fast thinker that she is, well, she sat Angie down. She was around eight years old, sat her down and gave her a haircut. And what she did is she cut the hair around her ears so she could not tuck the hair behind her ears. So, um, I don't know how well your imagination is, but Pretty much, she had a mullet, okay? My eight-year-old sister <laughs> had a mullet. And um, to me, like, this was really good. Like, it's a good memory. It's great. Uh, for some reason, Angie, um, I found out yesterday that, or two days ago, that uh, wasn't that great of a memory for her. <laughs> I guess I can kind of see that. And, um, well, you know what? I... I feel like it's very important that you get a visual of this. I, I think for you to understand um, what God's wanting to tell you this morning, you need to see this. So I, I took the liberty of printing up a picture. I, I searched for it. I found a, a picture of Angie with this, this haircut. Um, I don't know how well you can see it um, through the camera, but this is Angie um, with a mullet. I think that's important for this message that you get that in your head. Um, Angie with a mullet. Okay. <laughs> she is going to kill me. Anyways. Um, so the perception was a little different and we have a lot of that going on right now, don't we? I mean, I don't know if you've heard of this thing, um, called ah, COVID-19. I mean, it's out there. I, I don't know if maybe it sound, is, sounds familiar. Right, like everybody knows about it. If you have any kind of social media or you watch any kind of news or you talk to anybody, 
unless you're living under a rock, you know about the coronavirus. We're all stuck in our house. We're not supposed to go anywhere. And, um, well, I've seen a lot of different perceptions out there. And it doesn't, it doesn't mean there's a wrong perception or right perception, but we all look at things and view things different. So right now, obviously, we are not meeting in the building. Normally, on Saturday nights, we would meet, before all this mess started, we would meet at 3822 Edwards Road in Fort Pierce. That's where we met every Saturday night. Well, we can't do that right now. So what we're doing instead, we're doing it online. Now, some people would look at that and say, man, that's terrible. And in ways it is because uh, I miss you guys. Like I miss hanging out with our TBE family. Um, my family, my personal family, we went through um, a situation this past week. We had a death in the family. Um, and it would have been nice to just be around everybody and be surrounded. So I see the point in that with not meeting in a building. But on the other side of that, I feel there's been a lot of great things that have happened because of this. I think it is um, an example of how God takes things that are meant for evil, and that is 100% what this is, okay? This thing, COVID-19, the coronavirus, it is not from God. God did not send it to us to punish us. It is not because you or I or somebody sinned somewhere. That is not what's happening. And I am not taking this thing lightly. I mean, it is taking the most precious thing that walks this earth, which is the human life. It is taking that away. And that is not something to take lightly. Uh, I think right now we are over 200,000 people have died because of this. So it is a very serious thing. And I, I can look at this, though, and I can see how God has taken this and he has used it for his good. Because one, we are now, we are on Saturday night. We had our worship experience last night. We had our Zoom meeting. We got to hang out and do all that. I thank God for the technology and the tools that allow us to do that. And now, something that we would not be able to do normally, or thought, of, thought to do, I guess we would have been able to, but didn't really think to do it, is have a worship experience on Sunday morning. So I think it's pretty cool how God takes those things that are meant for evil, and is meant for destruction, and he turns them for his good. And I believe that is what he's doing right now. But if you talk to a bunch of different people, their perception of what's going on with the coronavirus is different. Which I would expect it to be because we are all different people. I mean, I'm not going to like the same movie that you like or not, not 100% of the time or you like the same television show that I like because we're different people. We're not robots, right? We all have different perceptions. So that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. And I want to, we're going to focus in on some three of the disciples, three of the 12 that followed Jesus and how they each had different perceptions and how they were each different individual people. So um, we are going to start with Matthew chapter 18, verse 1, and we're going to read to 4. And, and then we're going to read three different stories. Same story, but from three different people. So this is coming from Matthew, the formal, former tax collector. Matthew 18, 1 through 4, it says, At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child to himself, and he sat him before them and said, Truly I say to you, Unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. That's Matthew's take on this story. Next, we're going to see what Peter says. Now, it's in the book of Mark. Mark is writing this down. Peter is telling him the story. Mark is... is, is um, Typing it all well, of course, not typing it. I don't think, I mean, I'm not a history buff, but I don't 
think um, they had, you know, Apple computers back then. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it was like Tandy 1000s. You remember those? That was, oh my goodness. That <laughs> just came to me. That was my first computer ever, a Tandy 1000. I thought we were big stuff back in the day. All right, so this is Peter. He's telling the story to Mark. Mark's writing this down on his Tandy 1000. Um, it says, they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he began to question them. What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way, they had discussed with one another which one is the greatest. Sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Taking a child, he sat him before them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me. And whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. So that's Peter's take on this story. Now, the next we're going to go to Luke, Dr. Luke. We're going to see what the good doctor has to say about this same story. Luke chapter 9, verse 46 through 48. It says, an argument started among them as to which of them might be the greatest. But Jesus, knowing what they were thinking in their heart, took a child and stood him beside, beside him and said to them, Whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For the one who is least among all of you, this is the one who is the greatest. So we're going to look into this in just a minute. Before we do, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for everybody that is watching, everybody that is looking at this video, whether it is on Sunday morning, whether it's live or whether it is 10 years from now, you have a reason, I believe, for them to watch this. It is not by an accident that they just uh, tuned in or just landed on this video, but you have something for them. And I, help, I pray that you help us all, all of us stubborn people to open up our minds, open up our hearts, and receive exactly what you have for us. I also thank you, Lord, that real men wear purple. And, of course, I thank you that not only Tom Brady, but also his tight end, Rob Gronkowski, is a Tampa Bay Buccaneer. We thank you so much for that. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right. Um, <laughs> thank you for tuning in. I have my coffee here. This is only like um, my third cup. I, this is not normal. Usually I'm like up to five cups this morning, so I may not be as you know um, energetic as normal, but I am going to stop and take frequent pauses to um, take a sip of coffee. And um, you know that's what I'm going to do. And I'll probably announce it every time I do. That's good stuff. Toasted coconut. It's amazing. From uh, it's great value. Walmart brand. Why? Because I'm a baller on a budget. But uh, anyway, so I want to talk about perception. I want to talk about these three disciples. So, have you ever felt insecure? That's my question for you this morning. Just ask yourself: Have I ever felt insecure? Well, all of us are going to answer yes, right, to that. I mean, if we're all honest, there's times that we have. Well, I'm going to admit something to you. Uh, around this time, right now, with the whole coronavirus and COVID-19, um, I think it's amazing that so many churches are finding ways to stay connected and reach out to people. And a big way that we've all been doing that is through social media. Now, some people do it better than others. And um, definitely, I don't feel like I'm someone that does it better than others because I, it's so easy to turn on to Facebook or Instagram or YouTube or any social media and see what other churches are doing right now. And there is one church that I tune into frequently and the pastor, he is amazing. But what he does at 6 a.m. every morning, he gets on social media 
and he has a message for everybody. Now, like I'm thinking, um, I don't even know if is Jesus even awake at 6 a.m. Like, seriously. Um, well, okay, of course he's awake, but I just kind of find that he is more talkative, like around 1 p.m. than 6 a.m. Okay, but no, anyways, um, I look at this and I'm like, I should be doing more. Like, and insecurity comes up in me and I'm like, how does he even, I mean, the messages are good. They're amazing. Like, I'm taking notes and stuff. Not at 6 a.m. I watch it later, not when it's live. I mean, get serious, okay? Like, this is real life stuff. Um, but I'm just like, how does he do it? And I'm thinking, should I be doing that? Like, should I be getting on every day and giving a different message? Like, maybe that's what I should do. So insecurity is like rising up in me. And then I'm seeing other churches that come out and they have this plan. Like, how we are going to get back to normal or how we are going to get back to where we were. And I'm thinking, um, well, my plan, um, well, I just... <laughs> You know, the spiritual thing is like, I just want to be led by Jesus. Yeah, I just free, I'm, a, I'm more of a free spirit. You know, um, I'm just going to get led, I'm just going to be led by Jesus. Well, not always, but sometimes that's code for, yeah, I'm too lazy to come up with a plan. And I'm not saying that too lazy for that. We, we have things in work to, that, and, and ideas of how to get back to us getting together through all of this. We don't want to put anybody at risk, of course, but we have a leadership team. I thank God for that, that we have a leadership team, so it's not just me making these decisions. But I'm looking at all of this and all these plans. They got it all charted out, and you can go on their website. You can look at it and um, all of that stuff, and I'm just like, man, I just, you know, just if I could, I would just sit around and watch Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and Saved by the Bell all day, like I did as a teenager, like if I could. Of course, I can't do that. Um, been praying for that. Not really. Okay, not really. Um, okay, so if you this is the first time you're ever watching this, just know, like, I make jokes. I just throw stuff out there, and that's when you know I'm really uncomfortable. Like, you don't know what to say next, so he's trying to be funny. And um, if we were all together, what would happen? Our TBE fam, they know, and they, they love me, so they just kind of do this fake laugh, and I just, you know, I feel good about myself. So... In my head right now, you guys are all just laughing, and I'm thinking that I am, like, um, at a comedy club, I guess. Anyways, and then, like, I saw something just the other day. Now, this is something I don't normally see un when, until, like, New Year's, when people start coming out with their goals for the new year. But I saw somebody come out, a pastor, and um, an amazing man of God, and he's like, I am going to go on a 40-day fast. That is what I'm doing. I'm going on a 40-day fast starting today. He announced it to everybody. And I'm like, oh, shoo, 40 days of not eating, right? And I'm trying to justify it in my head. I'm like, well, you know, I haven't watched basketball since Michael Jordan retired in 1999. Yes, I know he came back for a couple years with the Wizards. That don't count. We act like that didn't even happen, okay? That we pretend that Jordan was never a Wizard. Um, I mean, I haven't watched hockey. Like, I've, if we're being honest, I've been like on a 41-year hockey fast. It's pretty impressive. I've never watched one game of hockey in my life, all right? Nor do I plan to. I'm going to keep fasting hockey, you know, for Jesus. Okay, just because I don't like it. That's why. Um, I mean, I haven't played with Legos for a long time. Like, it's been years since I... Okay, days... All right, minutes since I've played with Legos. But I, I'm not going to play with Legos like why I'm doing this message. Um, <laughs> uh, now, also like these different diets. So my wife, Julie... Amazing woman. She's awesome. Beautiful. Um, she's in the next room. So, of course, um, what I say about her here, because this is coming from our house, um, you know, it's very important that 
she stays happy today. But anyway, she's beautiful. She's an awesome woman. I love her. I'm so blessed. But she has decided to do this diet where she's gluten free. And I'm like, I have no idea what gluten really is. Like I've heard people talk about being gluten free. Like is I thought it was like a joke. I thought it was just something we, you know, <laughs> gluten, no gluten. I, I had no idea. But she stuck to this gluten free diet. So now like we have all this weird stuff. Like she sent me to the store the other day. I, I had to go in to Walmart and find gluten free bread. All right, come on. Now, I will say this. This is a time right now because everybody's buying up bread and buying up groceries. There was tons of the gluten-free stuff. It was like all there. Also, it's because like a loaf of bread is like 10 bucks. I mean, you can buy a loaf of Wonder Bread for like a dollar. So um, there is that. So I got that. But like she stuck to this gluten-free thing. And I'm like, well, I don't plan to eat ice cream like maybe until Thursday. Now, we all know, come tonight when it gets late, like, I'm, I'm most likely going to eat some ice cream tonight. Like, most likely, some butter pecan ice cream's coming out of the fridge, okay? So, but I'm going to, like, my plan is not till Thursday. You know, I'm definitely not going to be gluten-free. That's crazy talk. And we cannot afford $10 loaves of bread for both of us. It's a luxury only my wife gets. And I am not going to tell her no. Okay, so, um, so I was told, I, re I remember being told back when I was in my 20s, they said, and I was talking to somebody about my insecurities, and they said, don't worry, it's not a big deal. The older you get, the less you will have those insecurities. Those insecurities will fade. Can I tell you right now, that dude lied to me. Because my, my insecurities definitely have not faded as I get older. But what is it about comparison? I think we all do it. We compare each other. You know, do we measure up? Are we good enough? Are we smart enough? And right now, in this day and time, we have this like digital scoreboard that keeps track of our so social status. It's called social media. Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, um, Snapchat, all that stuff. It's like this social scoreboard. And we look, and it's easy to look at it and feel insecure. So my question again is, have you ever felt insecure? And maybe you're like, yeah, like right now, like every day, like every minute of every day. Maybe that's you. Um, well, I just want you to know that you are in good company. Because right here, we have three disciples who obviously there is some insecurities going on, okay? They are arguing about who's the greatest. If you don't have insecurities, you're not going to get into an argument or into a debate about somebody about who's the greatest or who does something better than you or you do something better than somebody else. You're not going, you're not going to care if you don't have insecurities, but we have these disciples and they are arguing about who's the greatest. And I find it very interesting that we have documentation of not only their, their insecurities, but also their perceptions. And as they tell the story. So we're going to get into that. I'm going to take a sip of coffee. Mm. So good. So good. You got to get it. Toasted coconut is at Walmart. Great value brand. Um, we they they don't even sponsor us. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Like we were sponsored by Walmart, and um, I, I don't know if our leaders would, would our leaders would y'all accept that? I mean, I would push for it. Like, yeah, it's good. We can just do this. All right. So here we go. We got. We're gonna start with Matthew. Now, Matthew. He is a former tax collector. Just to give you a little information about tax collectors, they were Jewish, but they, by, the Jewish people did not look at them as being Jewish. They were considered traitors. They were employed by the Roman government. They would go in and collect taxes, which pretty much just made up in their head or made, the Roman government would tell them they would go collect taxes from the Jewish people and then they would take that money to the Roman government. They would give the tax collectors a cut. They were pretty wealthy people. 
So Matthew was a former tax collector before he started following Jesus. Now, this is how Matthew's story goes. Matthew's telling this story. And he's like, yeah, hey, man. Hey, um, so here's the thing. And um, I have no idea um, why I, in my head, Matthew has this Italian accent. And you have to forgive me. Um, my Italian I got, is, is not perfect. Um, you know, my Brooklyn type Italian, which may end up by the end of this be Scottish, truthfully. But Matthew's like, hey, man, um, so this is, this is how it goes, right? Um, so me and the other disciples, we were walking and um, we were arguing about who's the greatest. You know, and of course, well, I'm the greatest. And Matthew um, was a tax collector. And there's a good possibility in my mind that he could have maybe been over the budget and stuff, like over the money and creating like some kind of budget. So I can see Matthew saying something like this. You know, we're talking about who's the greatest. And we all know, you know, it's me. I'm the greatest. Um, I mean, I handle the money. Like I, 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 I balance the checkbook. You know, I mean, that's what I do. And um Listen, this is top secret information, but um, little secrets out that it's a little rumor. Um, when the New Testament is written, this new book, New Testament of the Bible, um, well, my book's gonna come out first. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna be like the first book, like the book of Matthew. It's gonna be number one book in the New Testament. So obviously, I'm the greatest, but. We're sitting, I, we just walk up to Jesus. We're like, yo, Jesus, what up, man? Hey, um, uh, which one of us is the greatest? Now, this, check this out. This is what Jesus does. Tip, so classic Jesus. Jesus, he looks for a child. There was a child walking around. There were a bunch of children, but there was just one child. There's a guy, here's a boy. His name was Tony, I believe. His name was Tony. He said, like, hey, Tony, come over here. He called him. He called the child. He brought the child over and he said, hey, um, unless you uh, become like this child, you will not enter the kingdom of God. You've got to humble yourself as this child. So that's what he said. So that's Matthew's story of this. That's Matthew talking about this. He says that they just walked up and they asked Jesus, who's the greatest? And then Jesus called a child. That's Matthew, the former tax collector. Um, and just for the record, he was a tax collector in the town where they were going to, Capernaum. All right, so that's Matthew's story. Now let's get to Peter. Let's get to the apostle Peter. He's telling this story to Mark. Going to drink some coffee. And um, so here's Peter's story. He don't say anything about the disciples walking up to Jesus and asking. Peter's more like this. He's telling the story. He's like, so, all right, guys, we, um, this is what happened. Okay, we went on this, we started traveling, and we ended up in Capernaum. By the way, my hometown. Okay, and um, where were we staying? We were staying at my house. Yeah, that Jesus, all the other disciples, like, they were all, I was like, hey, guys, come hang out at our, my house. Now, Listen, some people's going to say it's my mother-in-law's house. Like, some people argue about that. It's not my mother-in-law's house, guys. It's my house. Peter's house. I mean, like, yeah, my mother-in-law stays with us. Like, she has a room. Oh, yeah, it's the master. I'm just being a nice guy, you know. Um, but if, you know, if I wanted her out, if I wanted to kick her out, she'd be gone. My house, okay? Not my mother-in-law's house. So get that out of your mind. We're staying at my house. And we get there, well, all of us disciples were discussing this thing. What were we discussing? Um, well, we were discussing who's the greatest. Like, we were talking about it, you know. And uh, Matthew, he thought he was the greatest because, oh yeah, he handles the budget. He handles the checkbook. Like, this is Jesus. This is the Son of God. Like, I mean, he is taking fish and loaves of bread and multiplying it in his hands, okay? He's turning water into wine. Like, how hard is it to be, like, the money guy, the budget guy for Jesus? I mean, come on. Does he really, does Jesus really need one? Like, we just let Matthew think he's important. But he's like all talking about how he's the greatest and we're all discussing this. Well, 
Jesus calls us out on this. Like, Jesus, he, he knows what we're talking about. So he asks us, he's like, hey, hey guys, hey, um, what are you talking about? Oh my goodness, Peter, like, what did y'all do? Like, what, when Jesus called you on this and y'all talking about, what did you do? <sighs> Dude, truthfully, man, we just ignored it. Like, we were just like, he's like, what are you guys talking about? We just, like, pretended to do something else. We were like, um, I, we just kind of looked the other way. And he's like, Jesus is like, hey, God, what, what are you talking about? Not, nothing. Not, but he knew. Like, Jesus knew what we were talking about. Like, this is Jesus. Like, we're going to keep anything from him. Okay? So he called us on this. And he's like, you guys are talking about who's the greatest, aren't you? What? What? Jesus. What do you think we're talking about? That? Like, who? Who's the great? He's like, yeah, yeah, that's what you guys are talking about. So check this out, guys. This is what Jesus did. So classic Jesus. Um... There was this, there was kids run around everywhere. I mean, it's my mother-in-law, I mean, my house. And um, always kids there hanging out. Like, we, the kids are invited over. And neighbors' kids and kids across the street. Everybody's running around, hanging out. Well, Jesus, a kid runs by Jesus, this boy. He, Jesus takes him and he puts him in front of him and he wraps his arms around this kid. Man, it was emotional, man. I mean, he, like, Jesus is hugging this kid. Okay, and he's like, hey guys, um, whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me. And whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. That's what he said. That's why he took him in his arms. So Peter don't say anything about them asking. Actually, Peter says the opposite. He, says, he didn't say they went up. Like Matthew said, they went up and asked Jesus. Peter's like, we just avoided the question. Like, we didn't talk about it at all. Jesus called us on it. That's what Peter's saying. Okay, so Matthew said they asked. Peter says they, well, they pretty much avoided it. So let's look at the very intelligent, distinguished Dr. Luke and what he says. So Dr. Luke is telling this story. Luke chapter 9, we're starting with verse 46. And he's like, yo, man, we were walking to Capernaum. And this argument started like, okay, first, I mean, I'm a doctor, right? I'm a physician, okay? I don't normally get into arguments. But I heard the disciples and like Matthew was all like, I'm the greatest because I handle the money. Pfft, okay. Peter is like, I'm the greatest because we're going to go stay. Obviously, we're staying at my house. Dude, pff, we all know that ain't your house, Peter. That is your mother-in-law's house. Like, we all know that. You're not fooling anybody. You just admit it, okay? You stand with your wife's mama. So that whole greatest thing, it just kind of got to me. So, yeah, I'll admit it. I joined in with this argument. And we're arguing back and forth about who's the greatest, okay? Now, Jesus... He notices, I mean, we were being pretty loud. Obviously, he noticed. I don't know, like, why we were being so loud. Maybe we just forgot Jesus was walking with us. I mean, I don't know. We just kind of lost our mind. And um, so Jesus, knowing what we're thinking in our hearts and knowing what's going on, well, he took this child. This child just came out of nowhere. Jesus took him. He stands him right beside him. And he says, whoever receives this child in my name, receives me. And whoever receives me, receives him who sent me. For the one who is least among all of you, this is the one who is the greatest. So right now, we have three different disciples. We have Matthew, former tax collector. We have Peter, hot-headed Peter, you know, um, saying we just avoided it. And then we have Luke, Dr. Luke, who says, yo, man, we were arguing, like, big time. Like, we were going at it, like, yelling, and there might have been some pushing and shoving. I, we just were arguing. Jesus was right there. We lost our mind. Now, a lot of people would look at this and say, yep, see, right there. 
yeah, the um, Bible's inconsistent. These guys are telling the same story, and it's obviously, it's different. Inconsistency. Well, that's not what's happening. What we're getting is different perspectives of what's going on, but each one of these perspectives is showing one thing, and that is that they all three have this insecurity, and they're talking about who is the greatest. Now, I want to point out that we all, each one of us, it's really it's messed up that we get in this comparison thing because really there's no comparison because what my assignment is is going to be different than what your assignment is. You're going to see things a little different than I do. So here we have Matthew, former tax collector. His assignment here is to write to the Jewish people. That's what he's writing to. And he is writing and he is being direct. We just walked up to him and asked. Then, now Peter, so for all of you that are like me and you're avoiders and you're emotionally unstable, um, like me, well, <laughs> Mark is your gospel, is your book, the book of Mark. Because Peter's saying here, he's like, yeah, we just avoided the question. Jesus called us on it. We avoided it. Then you got Dr. Luke, who his assignment, well, pretty much is to write in street Greek. And um, he is saying, well, we argued. We flat out, I'm not denying it. Yeah, we were arguing about it. So we got three people, different perspectives, but still dealing with their insecurities. So I'm going to talk about three different types of people. And I feel like if we're all being honest and we're opening up our minds and our hearts, we will find ourselves in at least one of these people. So first we have Matthew. And Matthew is the asker. We just went up to Jesus. We just asked him. We were just direct. So here's how the asker kind of works. Hey, man. Hey, what's up, bro? I, I thought we were best friends. Like, I really thought, like, we were best friends. But honestly, I've been thinking about this and, like, you're never there for me. Seriously. Like, I'm always there for you. And you are, let's just face it, you were never there for me. I mean, you never returned my phone calls. I mean, and quite frankly, you never liked my pictures on Facebook. I don't know how to bring this up, but okay, yes, I do. I'm just going to say, like, you don't even follow me on Instagram. Dude, do you even know I'm on Snapchat? I bet you don't. I bet you don't. I thought we were friends, man. So here's my question. Are we best friends? Simple question. Just give me a simple answer. Yes or no. Are we best friends? Because I've been noticing, I've been keeping track of this, like, last week. Well, you spent six hours and 53 minutes with Tanya. And then you only spent six hours and 22 minutes with me. So my question, are we or are we not best friends? Let me know. Yes or no? Come on. That's what an asker does. You're direct. Maybe you are someone that's direct. Maybe you know somebody that's direct. But that's Matthew. Now we get to the book of Mark. We're talking about Peter. I'm going to take a sip of coffee. And Peter, well, he's the avoider. I know this well because, well, I'm an avoider. All right. So this is how it goes with an avoider. <clears throat> hey, man. Hey, dude. Peter, um, I'm sorry I didn't call you back the other day. I saw that you called me. I meant to call you back. I I'm sorry I didn't. It's fine, bro. Yeah, man, I don't need you to call me, bro. Yeah, I'm good, dude. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't need you. You think I'm just sitting around, like, waiting for your phone call? No, oh, man, it's all good. It's all good. We're good, bro. Yeah, I mean, psh, come on. Play a please, you think. I, I didn't even notice you didn't call me. Like, you didn't call me? Yeah, I thought, psh, I, don't, I don't even remember calling you. Now you, yeah, man, we're cool, bro. Yeah, I don't need you. Just me and God, dude. Just me and God. Yeah. Um, I'm not waiting around. You think I'm waiting around? No, no, man. We're good, dude. We're good. All right, all right Peter. All right, that's cool. That's cool. 
Now, psychology tells us that this is called deflection and, well, they actually crave approval and the feeling to measure up. Yes, I know this well. This is me, okay? So, someone that I go up to Peter, hey, Peter, hey, dude, crazy shirt, bro. Cra crazy shirt. You think I care, dude? I don't wear shirts for you. I ain't wearing this shirt for you, man. Yeah, I wear shirts for me. Oh, all, all right, Peter. Well, all right, man. Yeah, 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 that's right. It's all right. All right, hey, you're a grown man. All right, man. That's right. That's right. I do stuff for me. That's how the avoider operates. The third person, and this is Dr. Luke. Well, he's the arguer. All right. <laughs> um, are you an arguer? Do you know an arguer? Are you married to an arguer? If you are watching with your spouse right now, you just listen. All right, play it cool. Just be like, what's he talking about? Like, well, I know, baby. You ain't. Nah, nah, nah. So just play it cool. Play it cool. All right. So there's askers. So are we? Are, are we best friends? There's avoiders. Yeah, I don't need you, bro. I don't need you to call me. I think I'm staying around waiting for you to call me. And now, then there's the arguers. Arguers operate similar to this. Hey, man. Hey, yeah. Hey, dude. What do you lift? Seriously, like, what do you bench, bro? 200? 225. All day. All day. Well, truthfully, like, I don't even know to go to the gym, bro. Like, I don't. Like, I got good genetics. Like, see this right? It's all natural. Like, I, if I don't want to, I don't even got to go to the gym. But when I do, 225. All day, bro. Yeah. Hey, man, I, how many followers you got on Instagram? How, how many you got? 50? 150? Gee. 10,000, bro, right here. YouTube, too. Like, tons of subscribers on YouTube. Like, seriously, YouTube called me the other day, and... Um, they're going to pay me to do some subtle ads, you know, on my YouTube channel. And no big deal, but I'm probably going to be making like an extra 500 bucks a month. Like, I don't even know what I'm going to do with it. No big deal. How many how many subscribers? Do you even have a YouTube channel? Do, do you? Do you have a podcast? I got a podcast. That is how the arguer handles himself. And that is why... Our good friend Dr. Luke is. So I just feel like we need to actually, and I'm wrapping up here, but I feel like we might as well just talk about stuff that you know really affect our lives. And here's Jesus' response. He finds a child, takes the child, he puts him in front of the 12 disciples, and he's like, You want to know where you rank? And they're all like, Well, yeah, yeah, actually, we we do. It says, whoever can be like this boy, whoever can be teachable have humility, well, that's who's the greatest. Now, no question, all 12 of the disciples sucked air. <gasps> because back then, kids were pretty much thought of as non-people. Like, you, you hear, like, kids should be seen but not heard. Well, back in those days, kids should not be seen nor heard, you know? And Matthew, he's telling us one interaction. Peter's telling us another interaction. Luke is telling us another interaction. Keep in mind, in this story, you and I are supposed to put ourselves as the disciples. We're also putting ourselves as the child. Jesus is still Jesus, okay? But we are putting ourselves as the disciple. We're also putting ourselves as the child. And look what, just real quickly, look what Matthew says. Look what Matthew says. And um, John, if you could play some very spiritual music because we all know um, cannot close a service without spiritual music. Um, so play something good too. Uh, uh, so Matthew's saying, look what he says. He says, Jesus called the child. That's what he said. He's called it to him. So you're about to see three things that if you take literally, I believe, and you will take them and accept them and believe them, you, it will hugely impact your life. So Matthew says, Jesus called the child. You notice Peter and Luke, they said nothing about Jesus calling 
the child, nothing about it. But Matthew is wanting you to know, Matthew the asker who is direct, a direct person, he's wanting you to know that the child was picked. Was there other children around? Possibly, probably. I think it's a fair expansion of the text. But he wants us to know that Jesus chose that child. So he's wanting you and me to both know that I am called to be like a child and like this child, Jesus called me. So you and I, we are supposed to be like this child, but he's also wanting us to know that like this child, you and I are called by Jesus, all right? Now, are all the disciples picking up here what Jesus is laying down? I don't know, but the portrait, I believe, is on purpose. Now, look how Peter describes this story. Peter says, when Jesus brought the child, he put the child in front of him. He don't say anything about Jesus calling the child, but he says, he says something that Matthew and Luke doesn't say. He says, Jesus put the child in front of him. And look at this. He says he wrapped his arms around the child. He hugged the child. Matthew says nothing about Jesus wrapping his arms around the child. But what stuck in Peter's mind is that Jesus put his arms around and held the boy. Why? Because you know what avoiders need? A hug. A hug. And I remember as a teenager, my mom would come in and I would be, I just would get mad. I'm a teenager. I'm getting mad over, I don't even know why I was mad. I'd get mad. I'd just come home. I'd slam the refrigerator. Like, we don't got any food. Like, there's tons of food, but I'm like, we don't have any food. What's up with this crap? Blah, 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 whatever. My mom would come in. She would not get in an argument with me. She would just wrap her arms around me. She would give me a kiss, and I'm like, stop it, Mom. I'm like 17 years old, man. And I wouldn't hug my mom back. At first, and she would just wrap her arms around and just hug me tight. And she was pretty much just saying, well, I'm gonna hug you until you let me hug you. And that's what my mom did. Like eventually I just realized that she wasn't gonna stop hugging me until I just gave up. And I believe that's what God does to so many of us. He wraps his arms around us and we're like, dude, God, stop it, man. I wanna be mad. I want to be upset. I want to hold on to this. And God's just like, man, I know you're sad. I know you're upset. I know you've been avoiding these things in this situation. I'm just going to hug you. I'm gonna, I love you. I'm going to give you a kiss. Stop it, God. No, I'm not going to. I'm going to hug you until you let me hug you. So... I believe that's what God does. So Matthew says the child's called. Peter uh, says that the child is held, is hugged. Look what Luke says. Crazy how we all see different things and we all see in Jesus what we need when we need to see, to see it. Luke says, and he put the boy by his side. He put the child by his side. Now, I don't have time to really go into what it means to be called, what it means to be held, and what it means to be beside God, beside Jesus. But I believe Jesus is saying in this message, through these three disciples, what he is saying is, I want you to know you are accepted, you are loved, you are held, and you are right beside me. Saying, hey guys, I picked you. I could have picked anybody. I, I picked you. I picked you to be you. Yeah, that was me. I, I chose that. I picked that. I picked you. And you know what, man? I got my arms wrapped around you. I know you're hurting right now. I know you're upset. I know you don't know what the future holds. I know you don't even know what's gonna happen the next hour. I know you've been stressed about this situation. I know, I know you've been worried about finances. You've been worried about your job. You've been worried about your 
family, you've been worried about your kids, you've been worried about your bills, I love you. I not only chose you, I not only picked you, but my arm, I'm wrapping my arms around you and I'm gonna hug you and I'm gonna do to you, let me hug you. And then he's saying, hey man, I know you got some stuff, but I love you and you are right here by my side. I am right here with you in this. I know it don't always feel like it. I know sometimes you feel so many, so much you feel like you're alone and you got this chip on your shoulder. But I've never left you. And right now, as you're going through all of this, I not only picked you, you're not only wrapped in my arms, but I am right here beside you through it all. I believe that's what God's telling us this morning. He's telling you are loved, you are cared for, you are in his arms. You are by his side. And I know my daughter, I have a six-year-old. Her name is Kinsley. She is amazing. If you know her, you love her because she's loved by everybody. But normally when Kinsley approaches somebody or somebody approaches her, Kinsley's very shy. Like she'll kind of, she's bashful until she gets to know you. But what I've noticed is when we go somewhere and I'm with her and she is by my side, well, she's a lot more brave. Why? Because she knows that her daddy is right there by her and her daddy is not going to let anything happen to her and is not going to let anybody hurt her. And if she does get hurt, her her daddy is going to hurt with her. I I told Kinsley one time she bit her lip. She went to the dentist. She had had to get filling. She had cavities and they numbed her lips. So if you've ever had that happen, you know like your nip... Your lip feels real, very numb and feels like big. And so she bit it. We told her, don't bite it. We stuck cotton in there. She still managed to bite her lip and had this huge sore. And it looked terrible. And I remember looking at Kinsley and I said, baby, I'm so sorry. I said, if your daddy could take that sore from your lip and put it on my lip, I would. That is always stuck in her mind. And she says all the time, like when she gets hurt, she scraped her knee the other day and she said, Daddy, if you could take my knee and trade it with your knee, you would do that. And I said, yeah, baby, I would. When you hurt, she, I am hurting that much more. I would rather have that scraped knee. I would rather have that lip, that sore on your lip than you have it. And she knows. She knows her daddy's going to protect her. She knows her daddy's going to be there, right there beside her and her daddy's going to walk with her and that is what I believe that's what God is telling us this morning is I'm right here I'm right here daughter I'm right here son I am walking with you and I'm going to leave you with this verse it's Proverbs 16 9 and it says the the mind of man plans his way so you and I we're trying to come up with all these plans just for life not just for the day but life in general. Sometimes we avoid them, but eventually we got to make the plans, right? So the mind of a man plans his way. But then it says, but the Lord directs his step. God, what is God focused on? Establishing the next step. He wants to take the next step with you. That's all. We're so focused on plans. He's like, I... I know right now this world is crazy. I know right now a lot of stuff's going on. I know right now you are dealing with a lot. Come on. I just want to take the next step with you. I just want to take the next step. And listen, I know steps aren't easy. Steps, well, we don't want to plan steps. We don't want to talk about steps because steps aren't sexy. Plans are sexy. How I'm going to be a millionaire. Oh man, one day I am going to marry the perfect man. Or I'm going to marry the perfect woman. One day I am going to have the perfect job. And when I get that job, everything is going to be perfect. One day I am going to be married. I'm going to have two and a half kids. I'm going to have that fancy car in the garage. I'm going to have that big house. One day. That's what we want to talk about, one day. And I believe God this morning is saying, Dude, forget about one day. 
because right now, all I'm focused on, all I want to do, I want to take the next step with you. All right, God, well, what, what happens? Okay, we take the next step. What, what happens next after we take the next step? Then I take the next step with you. All right, God, but how about after that? I take the next step with you. Come on. Come on, man. Just, just enjoy the step. Right now, I don't know who you are. I don't know who I'm talking about. But I know this, that God is telling you. And you know who you are. You can feel it. You just feel that tug. God's saying, I'm talking about you, man. I'm talking about you, daughter. I'm talk- this, this is for you. He's saying, come on. Let's take the next step. What is that for you? I don't know. Maybe it's picking up the phone and saying, hey. Hey, Dad. I forgive you. Yeah, I, I forgive you. I for, for why I, I forgive you. Maybe it's the next step is just saying, I know I haven't said it in a long time. Maybe it's what saying to your husband or to your wife. I haven't said it in a long time, but I just, the next step is just you saying, I still love you. I know we've been arguing. I know we've, we've gotten mad at each other and we've thrown up the, the divorce word. We've thrown up the big D word out there. We've talked about it. Like the kids just, they don't even know what to do because we're arguing so much. I just want you to know, I still love you. Maybe that's the next step. Maybe it's not going to be easy. Steps aren't always easy. But God's saying, take that next step. What does the next step look for you? Maybe it's just getting out of your pajamas you've been wearing for the last five days. But what is the next step? Whatever it is, can I tell you, God is wanting to take it with you. Let's just take the next step. Come on. Let's just step. So if that's you tonight and you're getting that tug or this morning, um, just know he's there. You've been called. He has his arms wrapped around you. You are by his side. He is standing there with you and he is ready to make the next step with you. You are not alone. He is there. And now if you're watching this and you're like, this is like a foreign language, like you might as well be talking Chinese. Like, I don't even know. I don't even know why I'm still watching this. Um, like, I don't even understand it. Like, I, 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 maybe you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. That can change right now. It is not a very complex thing. You don't got to get up and do a circle and raise your hand or call me or give any money. You don't have to do any of that stuff. It's just simply saying, Jesus, I believe in you. I confess you are Lord. You are my Savior. You died on the cross. And when he died on the cross, he switched places with you. It's not about, well, Jimmy, you don't know what I've done. It doesn't matter what you've done because it's not about you. It's about what he did on that cross for you and he did the ultimate life swap he switched places with you he switched places with me we are righteous not because of what we've done so forget about that it's about what he he's done so when we accept him as our savior it switches so now when we pray well on anything we do god the father when he looks at us he sees jesus you right now, you may be thinking God's mad at you. He's not mad at you. He loves you. He cares for you. And if that's you and you're saying, I don't have that relationship, we can change right now. And when we pray, you don't need to repeat after me or any of that stuff. You just say, Jesus, I believe in you. You are God. You are my Savior. Thank you for what you've done. Forgive me for my sins. It's going to be like you never even did it. Like they're just forgotten about. It's, it's so awesome. You know, like it's too good to be true. No, that's that's the gospel. That's Jesus. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you again for this time that we can all get together. I thank you for the tools that have taken place. And I thank you for everybody that's watching. And God, the person that is saying right now, they're saying, I don't I do not have a personal relationship with you. 
right now as they're asking for forgiveness, as they're saying, I believe in you, as they're saying, you are my Savior, you are God, right now, you are taking the place of, you are swapping places with them. You are forgetting about their sins. They are gone. They are wiped away. And now when God the Father looks at them, he sees his son. He sees Jesus. And it's amazing. I thank you for that. I thank you for those that right now, they are becoming new creatures in Christ. They are becoming a new person. I thank you for that. Lord, I'm praying for the person right now that they just need to take the next step. They need to stop with all the plans or what tomorrow holds and you're just wanting to take the next step with them and I pray that you just help them to realize that they are called that your arms are wrapped around them and you are right there by their side and you are not leaving and you are ready to make the next step with them and after that step you're going to make the next step and the next step and the next step and I thank you for that I thank you oh Lord thank you so much in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank you guys for watching. Don't leave because right now, Michael Briggs is standing by. He's going to lead us in worship. And then Pastor Rocky is going to come back on and he is going to close us out. I love you guys. If you need me, um, I'm here. If you don't know how to get a hold of me, go to tbe.church and there will be ways to do that or get a hold of any of our leadership. We are here for you. You are not in this alone. Thank you for watching. Uh, let's go to Michael Briggs.